Hazlip, and welcome to Soul. James Baldwin. Earth, Wind, and Fire. Stevie Wonder, Nicky Giovanni. Harry Belafonte. Al Green. Yo, this is every day. Can you imagine what Soul would have been like for a 20-year run? Los Angeles, Detroit, Newark. Cities across the country were erupting. There were so few positive African-American images on television. We needed to reimagine ourselves on this American landscape. Got any ideas, fellas? Live and in color from New York City, Soul. I'm Ellis Hayes, the producer of Soul. And we are happy to have you with us this evening. Ellis was a gardener, and he cultivated all of these people. Black voices speaking to the problems of our time. Ellis said, if we're going to do something for the black community, it's got to be a lot deeper, jazzier, even more controversial. It's about time I hear something besides blondes have more food. <laughs> Ellis already knew that black culture led, didn't pull, baby, let down. Be still, peace, be still. Every was revolutionary. The conversations he had between writers and poets. Of course you can lie to me. Treat me the same way you would treat him. I can't treat you. You must. Treat you grin at him all day long. You come on when I catch hell. Because I love you. I get least of you. Fake it with me. I asked him, why are you having Rasan Roland Kirk on? He said, because he's crazy. That program was so beyond its time that it was in time. Soul was giving TV exposure to activist revolutionaries. They want me to go to Vietnam to shoot some black folks that never lynched me, never called me nigger. You're so much more than Blacks all around the country say, yes. Stay high, sucker chump. You could do anything you wanted. The FBI was very, very disturbed by that. How does he get the trailer? I said, Ellis, this is a piece of history. Let's fight for it. <laughs> There exists, as far as I know, no TV program that deals with my culture so completely, so freely, and so beautifully. There is nothing, nothing we cannot do. Black seeds keep on growing. There's nothing but evolution in my soul. All right, I'm hey. so excited yes, yes me too because i remember man. just hunching all together in the living room to watch soul every 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 time it came on you know yeah so it's so exciting we're we're so pleased to have our guests on soul lounge monday night in the city on whcr 90.3 fm and our guest is the director melissa hayslip Yes, put together this fabulous documentary. <laughs> Melissa, welcome to Soul Lounge Primetime. How yes. are you today? Hey guys, thank you for having me. This is oh, uh, yes. absolutely, absolutely. That's a part of my history. That is the soundtrack of my life, no doubt. No, and, it's the yeah. soundtrack of my life. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to get into our own uh, personal soul moments, but we want to start out with yours, Melissa. Tell yes. us, start, let's start us at the beginning of this trip. Tell us what it was like. Uh, tell us what it was like growing up with uh, Ellis Hazlip was your uncle. Mm. Yes. And um, I want to hear a little bit about the road to... Uh, starting this journey and and then completing it because we know uh, independent film production is is a labor of love and it's a test of will and so you are obviously filled with a lot of love passion and will because you not only made this thing happen but you got it out in the midst of a pandemic so this is, we we want to unpack it all but tell us you know start us at the beginning of this journey for you. Yes. Well, first of all, I have to say shout out to you guys. Shout out to Harlem. I'm so honored to be here with you guys. And this is really special. This is a story about my family, but it's a story of our family, the black family, the black nation, the black mm -hmm. planet, you know, and this mm -hmm. is a story of soul. So I couldn't have the opportunity to share this with you. So the story really came about because I am actually the niece of Ellis Hazlip. Ellis Hazlip, for those of you who don't know, was a really special guy. He really was in love with blackness and he was in love with black culture and black music. That was the most important thing to him. And he wanted to show 
that there was a wide variety of beauty of black art, black love, black sister and brotherhood. And this was a time that was a tumultuous moment in America, 1968 to 1973. So, this was a moment also for us to redefine ourselves and to kind of push back on the narrative that was always criminalizing us in the media and just to show the beauty and the range of the black expression in a way that was for us, by us. So Ellis Hayes had created a show called Soul and it was right here in New York at WNET Channel 13, which mm -hmm. is the flagship PBS station right down to Columbus Circle. I had the great fortune of growing up with Ellis. I lived also up on the uh, Upper West Side, on 80th Street. Wow. And he, uh, before it was gent gentrified, mm -hmm. <laughs> dating myself now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know. Yeah, we and do so know. Yes. Ellis lived with us, even though he had his own place, uh, mm -hmm. Fifth Avenue down in Chelsea, mm -hmm. he liked hanging out and being in our house. And so I was a little girl when he was making the Soul Show. I didn't wow. really ever get to go to it because I was too young. Mm -hmm. But he would come home afterwards and he would bring with him these, what I thought were like magical friends. Mm -hmm. And I would be running around under the table trying to <laughs> you know, come out my little footy pajamas. And here's Uncle Ellis, Uncle Ellis. And it was just special. He would make uh, like oatmeal at night with strawberries and whipped cream and sit around the whole floor <laughs> with these gorgeous folks. And Tell us uh, some of the magical friends who, who you saw as a well, little girl. I didn't know until I grew up that it, it was like bouncing on James Earl Jones's knee. Mm -hmm. Wow. With that wow. It was like Melba Moore and Clifton Davis. I, I had a full mm -hmm. crush on Clifton Davis. I <laughs> of course you did. <laughs> Or, the window. Uh, exactly. <laughs> mm. Or it was actually, you know, um, Malcolm X had been assassinated and Ellis had been good friends with him, you know, mm -hmm. as part of the Harlem scene. And mm -hmm. so he looked after Betty Shabazz, his his widow and wife. Oh, wow. So mm -hmm. Betty would not come out because she didn't have the structure in place to keep her safe. But she knew Ellis and she loved him and he would send a car for her. Mm -hmm. and bring her and all her children to our house. So I'm oh, running yeah. around the table, underneath the table, playing with Malcolm X's kids. Uh -huh. Atla, Kabila, yeah. all of them. All mm -hmm. of them. You know, mm -hmm. and we're still friends. And nice. they invited me up to the center uh, mm -hmm. on the anniversary this year and last year, and I presented a part of the film that features um, both their parents. Mm -hmm. So this was my upbringing, like in this world, and Ellis Hayslip. People didn't really know his name, but they knew he had a show called Soul, and it was Harlem who crowned him Mr. Soul. Because they see him on the street and they go, there go, there go, that's the soul, that's Mr. Soul, yeah, that's Mr. Soul. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what's up, Mr. Soul? You know, so that's where he got his nickname, was from the Harlem streets. And he was all about Harlem and um, living here and making the world here, and building community and creating opportunities. So I knew I had to make this film because mm -hmm. this show is so important to our culture, but it's gotten lost. Mm -hmm. and Absolutely. It Absolutely. represents so much because it's the story of our music, first of all. Mm -hmm. And you get to see these artists in their prime or in the beginning. And they're mm -hmm. so, it's like a time capsule, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, totally. have, I have to tell the story because I have the added bonus of knowing Ellis so I can tell a, holistic story of this man mm -hmm. but then i can also bring forward this beautiful show which was just uh an affirmation of our black beauty and our black excellence mm -hmm. yeah uh, and, and, and certainly melissa we certainly know that if that show had not existed those artists those activists those, those writers uh, and uh, authors uh, influencers would you would not see them on johnny carson no and they would not and if you did it would be very brief you know granted yes. it's not, we did see, and there was a movie that came out by my, a friend of mine, Yorba Richin, the story of uh, when Harry Belafonte got to sit in. But right, again, yeah. it wasn't his show. He sat in for right. a week to be a guest host. I remember, yeah, but right. He didn't right. make the show. He didn't mm -hmm. have an all black team. He didn't have an mm -hmm. all black woman team behind him, you know? Yes, and he yes. Had 
creative and um, political decisions to make about the show. Mm -hmm. So that was what was different, was that Ellis Hazlip was the man behind this, and he was deeply rooted in the community. So do tell, in terms of him creating the show, was there a, a lot of creative license that he was given to do it in terms of assembling his own folks to actually put it together? That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. And he would not compromise. In the beginning, I think they were nervous. And so there were some people who were not black on the team. Um, mm -hmm. And one gentleman who really helped it come together, I call him the godfather of soul, even though he's white, because it mm -hmm. was his idea. So mm -hmm. we give him that little, little reverence and that... Um, uh, his name is Christopher Lucas, but he was a friend of Ellis. Mm -hmm. And so he said, I know somebody that's perfect. So he brought Ellis to the show mm -hmm. and he said, why don't we make a Black Tonight show? And Ellis said, uh, -uh. That's not what we need, but I'm gonna take that up. You know, I'm, I'm gonna let you finish. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> but I'm, I'm gonna make the show that we need something that's more grounded, more rooted, more jazzier, more controversial, and mm -hmm. that really reflects us. So that's not mm -hmm. really a Black Tonight show, but that was yeah. the only model they knew. Right. And right. Yeah. That he was given that opportunity. Right. It wasn't a Black Tonight show, but it was a Black show for tonight. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. you, yeah. you know, you just, you just, I mean, seeing some of those old clips with Nikki Giovanni, uh, uh, James Baldwin, seeing one of the greatest performances I ever saw in my life was Earth, Wind, and Fire at Madison Square Garden. So to see them performing on Soul, I mean, oh, blew me away. Right. But that Amazing. was that was before they got to Earth Wind. You That's know, true. They true. were they were not doing uh, no. You know, no Madison Square Garden concert. No. Right, concert. right, exactly. And they, that was their first time on television. Wow! Yes. And, and, their and television. they electrified because I can tell you that's my my clearest soul moment. And was walking by one day, and I think that either the TV was on or I was flipping channels, mm -hmm. and I caught this crazy performance. First of all, there's somebody playing this African thumb piano called the kalimba. Kalimba. <laughs> and, and so that was blowing my mind. And then there's this shirtless bass player who's on the <laughs> ground playing, and I'm like, what is uh, that? Yes, and the yes. next day I went out and bought that album, which was Last Days and Times. Last Days and, Days and Times, yes. And Jessica yes. Cleves was still sing Jessica singing. Jessica Cleves was still singing. Yes, right. and, yep. and my life was changed because that was totally. my introduction to Earth, yeah. Wind, and Fire. I never heard of him before that yep. day. So I think um, he really gave the world a boost in terms of giving giving this crazy ban this platform and then and, you know obviously many millions of records and hits later we have a much better understanding of that band and who they were but they mm -hmm. were just something so fresh and never been seen they were yep. not cut there was nothing like it before or since really and that's that was true. the nature of all the things he was such a a curator of our culture i mean to have a show where you can have Nikki G. Avani on one day and Kathleen mm -hmm. Cleaver's on the next. Yes. And, and Farrakhan and uh, it, it just amazing. And and a lot of that was above my head for that time. You know, I didn't, you know, I think it wasn't until later that, you know, like you, we didn't understand the, the impact of who these people were, but mm -hmm. we sure understood that music, you know. That's um, right. That That's universal. And, 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 and so the the combination of thought leaders uh you know authors poets and musicians in this in this mix in this in this gumbo that he created this media gumbo uh just just amazing so tell us about the moment that you committed to making this uh this film the moment was actually i remember it very clearly it was mm -hmm. 2009, so it was mm -hmm. a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And wow. I've been thinking about it for a long time. And he passed in 1991. Mm -hmm. I had cancer. It was really sad because he was only 61. Wow. And I, I realized that there, he was so unique that nobody, there was nobody out there like him. And mm -hmm. he's done so much for so many people. 
And though all those artists were with us at the time, but I realized, you know, there's going to be a moment when we're going to start losing our African-American icons of the 20th century. We're mm -hmm. already in the 21st century. Yep. Mm -hmm. And yep. I thought, but who's going to tell their stories? And we were still in a moment when diversity and, inclu and inclusion were not the buzzwords yep. you know, in the early 90s. And I just thought this is good. This is such an important story to tell to not get lost. That was also before the advent of the the real digital age and how everything is changing with social media mm -hmm. um, when, you know, in the turn of the century in 2000. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I realized, I think I'm uniquely positioned and I, I had waited at least a decade thinking somebody else would make the movie. Mm -hmm. Because I thought, oh, you know, Ken Burns going to make this or somebody <laughs> who has access to somebody who's famous, you know. Uh -huh. And with all due respect, I wanted it to be done well. And I didn't think that I, who was not famous, could, could you know, make something that was so ambitious. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it took a lot of learning and, and sort of building up my confidence in myself, but also building a team around me and, mm -hmm. and, and, and doing so much research that I realized that I had to tell this story. And we can get into this later, but this idea of who does tell our story, mm, that very... is really important. This idea of authorship, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, um, yes. And yes. that I am a black woman too, and a black woman mm -hmm. director, and our voices mm -hmm. need to be amplified right now. So all of that kind of came together, and mm -hmm. I realized, yeah, I, I think it does have to be me. Mm -hmm. But then it took a long time to get the funding together, and we mm -hmm. wanted it to have that same pedigree of being for us by us. We mm -hmm. didn't want to, you know, anyone else to own it. So we thought we would have to get uh, grants in order to um, support the, the the budget. So mm -hmm. that's what took so long is piecing together grants and trying to make people understand that this is an important show that does need to be funded and placed in the canon of significant um, television shows, even mm -hmm. though it was an unknown African American show, what it mm -hmm. represents is much is a much bigger story. Mm -hmm. So Melissa, do tell in terms of your then interest in getting into the, the film game, uh, mm -hmm. what did that come about about? You know, I come from a rich background of performing myself. I started out as an actor, singer, dancer, mm -hmm. and I had okay. studied at Dancer of Harlem in high school. I wanted to mm -hmm. be either a, a ballet dancer, like an Ailey dancer, or mm -hmm. a Dancer of Harlem. Mm -hmm. And I studied with the greats. I got to study with Mr. Ailey while he was still alive, and wow. also um, at Dance Theater at BTH, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. with, uh, uh, Arthur Mitchell. Okay, yeah. So, yeah. I soon realized, though, that it was hard to keep a career that way, and I moved into Broadway and acting and really enjoyed that life. I was on Broadway and did a couple of shows. I did The mm -hmm. Lion King, and mm -hmm. I did um, Jelly's Last Jam with Gregory Hines. Wow. And, mm -hmm. I, and it was Gregory who gave me my first chance to be in front of a camera for a film, two films that he did. One was for Showtime and one was for HBO. And mm -hmm. as I was on set, I started to see, okay, this is a, a much bigger way to tell the story. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to be a performer, but that's, that you can only give so much. But mm -hmm. if you could put all these elements together to tell a bigger story, I realized that the media was more appropriate for the type of storytelling I wanted to do, which mm -hmm. put me behind the camera. Gotcha. And that. And I realized that our stories needed to be told. That was key, too, is I wasn't seeing a lot of people like me, you know, yeah. homing projects. Yeah. And yeah. especially black women, you know, shout out to Ava DuVernay and, and Dee yep. Reese and, and the people yep. that are really making change now. Um, but that hasn't always been the case. And we have had to fight our way to get the type of recognition and to own our space as filmmakers and storytellers when the storytelling is is in our blood it's in our culture we're all griots yeah <laughs> you know? absolutely absolutely Everybody so that, tell us a little great. bit about the team that you put together because you really put you really went there <laughs> well you know this is like i said this is the big story it's mm. much bigger than me it's we there's so many stakeholders in the story as well mm -hmm. it's also a very 
big and important part of history. So mm-hmm. we wanted to combine, make sure not only was it entertaining, but that it was historically accurate because we realized we were kind of the first to explore in this kind of hybrid documentary style, the black arts movement mm-hmm. as it you know, sort of pushed up against the heels of the civil rights movement and all these elements coming together. You had the women's liberation, you had the anti-Vietnam era. So mm-hmm. that required somewhat of um, some serious scholarship as well. Mm-hmm. And we knew that in order to have grants, we needed to have an academic spine for this film. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. we looked to my greatest inspiration is Henry Hampton, who mm-hmm. created Eyes on the Prize. Mm-hmm. And, and he okay. actually built a school that, that was called the Henry Hampton School. And it was literally a school or like a... Um, a think tank of not just artists and people of the era and and students of the era, professors, but also academics and um, really brilliant minds, historians. And I thought if I could create a board of academic advisors, we knew, we know we'll always be safe. So we brought in people like Henry Louis Gates mm-hmm. and. Okay that we knew and we brought in the artists themselves like Sonia Sanchez and she was mm-hmm. a poet laureate of Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. We brought in the former president of the Urban League, um, Hugh Price. Mm-hmm. And it was just uh, professors from um, in various, po- who held various portfolios and had studied the era. All this was important to imbue a sense of history and academia so that the story would be inscrutable and the backbone of the story would be accurate because we could not get anything wrong. <laughs> wow. And, and you so, know, we put, so we had this board together and then mm-hmm. we started building, we built the team as well. And we also had Louis Messiah, who is a wonderful filmmaker and also runs the Scribe Video Center in Philly. Mm-hmm. So we, we brought together a wonderful team. And then the physical team, we had Sam Pollard, who's an amazing filmmaker. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, we brought together an incredible team of three different editors. And of course, we had to remember like the music, even though we were going to be featuring the music from the show, we needed music to pull the whole thing together. So we brought in Robert Glasper as our <laughs> composer. So, yes, yeah. right. yes, yes, uh, yes. I was yes. done. When okay. he said this, I was like, okay. Man. Oh, now okay. he was like, okay. Yeah. Like, all right, all right. You start okay. to sound like Den- Denzel. All right, okay, okay, okay. 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 <laughs> I got a funny Robert, I got a funny Robert Glassman story. He came in to do what we call a watch down. And that's mm-hmm. what we should. I had already scored the film in a way to, with all my favorite what we call temp music. Not mm-hmm. the real music, but you, you score the film with what you would want to be in the film. Every song, every scene. Of course, you're mm-hmm. never going to end up using all of that because right. it would be very expensive mm-hmm. and some of it's just impossible, you know, from mm-hmm. uh, clearances. And, and clearances so mm-hmm. and the, the canon is so huge and so important, but you do it so that you understand the pacing of the film, mm-hmm. the vibe that you want in each scene, and mm-hmm. the style. Mm-hmm. So when Rob G came in and washed it down, after about 10 minutes, he got up out of his chair and he ran out of the room. And I thought, oh, no. <laughs> and, he <laughs> and, he gra- and he had his phone with him. And I thought, oh, maybe he's you know, a really important guy. Maybe he's just getting a call or some artist, Bilal or Common, or someone's going to mm-hmm. call him up, right? And, and he didn't come in for a minute. I, and I, I stepped out into the lobby to make sure he was okay if he needed uh-huh. Thing, maybe coffee, tea, some a snack, and he was singing into his phone. And wow. I, said, <laughs> I was so inspired. He said, "I, I, I started composing a song, <laughs> and I just wow. couldn't get it in my phone so I wouldn't forget the melody." Incredible. <laughs> I was Okay, that's like See, <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's pure genius. That's, that's pure it. Genius. Yeah. 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 And I had never witnessed that to see him composing on the spot that he was so inspired and he he can do anything. You know, he yes. also had 
great success with the film about Miles Davis. They mm -hmm. won um, a Grammy for that for best compilation mm. soundtrack, which he mm. wrote all the music for that for the um, Don Cheadle film. Miles wow, Davis. absolutely! And he was the band that was playing, and they had to they didn't use the original Miles Davis music for that, so they had to cre recreate. All the music for Miles, incredible, mm -hmm. including what the guys would sound like when they're just warming up or you know practicing, rehearsing. All of that was real. So I knew that he was our guy, and I love the way Rob G works with other artists too, and that mm -hmm. he would bring in people to collaborate with that would really build up the the the, um, the film and the score. And he's the one who had suggested Layla Hathaway, and I was like, "Wow, hey, let's go!" <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So he's now, a genius. now you, now no you're doubt. cruising. Now you're like, oh, okay, all right. We've got something here. Wrote a wow. song called "Show Me Your Soul," mm -hmm. and it's incredible. You have to hear it. Mm -hmm. And it's the last song of the film. And so, as soon as I heard that, I knew that we had to start the film with her dad, Donnie Hathaway. Yes. So the first song you hear is "The Ghetto," but it's not mm -hmm. just any version of "The Ghetto." It's the live version of him playing on the soul show. Wow. You start the soundtrack with Donnie Hathaway and then you go through the long journey of the music of our our story mm -hmm. and then you end it with Layla Hathaway, the first, oh, the first daughter of soul. Well, and you know, these kinds of decisions were really important because I saw music as a character. I treated mm -hmm. music as a character. Not mm -hmm. as a backdrop mm -hmm. and not as filler, but you know that you can't tell the journey of a people without the journey of the music and you definitely can't tell the journey of soul without the music because that was so so much of the 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 through thread of the whole show exactly was the music and wow. L.A. would love music and he would mm -hmm. always he would proclaim these statements like my favorite which is in the film when he says r b is the floor for black pride Wow. And it was like, oh, because yeah. I did a lot of research and I found all the things that he said in various interviews and all. Of, I went to all the black press, the vintage magazines, everything, mm -hmm. and Jet, and, mm -hmm. and especially Jet. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> some of the later, the early Essence magazines. And I saw the way he spoke to the black magazines and the black press. It was different from the way he spoke to the white press and the mainstream press. And I pulled mm -hmm. all these quotes. And he was always out there trying to talk about his vision. And one of the things he would say was that R and B is a floor for Black Pride, and we have to recognize that, and 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 therefore uplifting and elevating the R and B and soul artists because they're speaking of our of our pride. They represent <laughs> that, and also gospel music being his everything. Mm -hmm. And you see all these influences in the show and how he supports these artists. You know, he had some incredible artists in the show. Y'all do a name check yet? <laughs> you, you, can give, a name you, check. Can, you can do the name check right now. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I don't know where to start. So, okay, well, of course, we already said Al Green. Right. Yep. Oh, yeah. Okay, Earth, Wind, and Fire. We talked mm -hmm. about that. Stinky mm -hmm. Wonder and Wonder yeah. Love was the Wonder mm -hmm. Love band. Wow. Which mm -hmm. is incredible. Um, but, but then some others like the Night Lighters, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sam, and, Sam and Dave in the early days. Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then when he started getting more money and getting more exposure and, and more, um, and, and the, the, the guests got splashier and more famous, he had the Spinners, the OJs. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Wow. He also had like real soul singers like Betty LeVette and Joe mm -hmm. Tex. A Joe Tex. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he had B.B. King. He had the original versus battle. He had mm -hmm. Gladys Knight, and he also had Patti LaBelle, but they weren't famous. Mm -hmm. They weren't really famous. You mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. That was the original versus battle. He had Black Heat with David Newman. He used to play trumpet for Miles. Mm -hmm. He had Black Ivory. When they were in the Olympics, oh. great when they did, you know, don't turn around. Don't, don't turn, turn around. around. Huh? Yes, <laughs> and you and I. Oh yes. That, he gave them their television debut, and they right. are Harlem. They are like home. That's right. Harlem heroes. Russell Patterson, all of them. Yes. Yep. yes. Russell yeah. Patterson, Stuart mm -hmm. Baskin, Stuart Baskin, mm -hmm. Leroy mm -hmm. Burgess, L. Yes. Boogie, Colin. 
Shout mm-hmm. out to Black Ivory. Those are yes. my guys. Mm-hmm. But he also had the Delphonics on there. Oh. And of course, he had people that you know and love and people who were an extension of them. So he had Carolyn Franklin on there. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. Carolyn Franklin, she's the sister of Aretha Franklin. Oh, okay. I did and not so, know. Yeah, she's a phenomenal singer. So mm-hmm. She was on there, Archie Bell on the drills. Oh, the drills. would tighten up everything. Listen, <laughs> even uh, Curtis Mayfield and the Impressions. Oh, mm-hmm. But what was amazing was Curtis Mayfield was a host. He let him host two shows. Wow. You had to hear Curtis Mayfield speak and mm-hmm. what was on his mind. And that, wow. was, that was different. Most R&B artists didn't get to have a full show where they could speak and have their yeah. ideas out there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then we can't forget the jazz because Ellis Hazen believed that jazz was an art form long before it got validated. So you had, you had um, Herbie Hancock on there with his M1 DC lineup. He had Thelonious Monk out there who, who never came out. You know, Thelonious Monk was like a record. Mm-hmm. Thelonious Monk performed with his son T.S. Monk. T.S. Monk. Wow. Okay. Yes. He, and, and Ellis did this tribute to jazz. He had a show called The Blue Note Show. And that was all the great jazz musicians, including uh, the last performance on television by Lee Morgan. Wow. Like wow. Literally a month before he was um, killed. Mm-hmm. And, of course, King Curtis was the house band. I mean, huh. mm-hmm. amazing. Mm-hmm. And he had Horace Silver, and um, he had uh, yeah, I had Max Roach on there a bunch of times with and Boom. Wow, wow! Yeah. I mean, but, and then of course, like Billy Taylor, and my favorite, Rasan Roland Kirk. Mm-hmm. Oh yes, yes, I oh, saw yeah. him doing, as they say, doing his stuff on stage, and people yeah. say, "Where's this coming from?" Where's <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Man. that's just the beginning. That's maybe half the artists. I mean, but, I'll be here all day, but it's just really But let's, let's also talk about the uh, the, the poets oh, and the, the activists. Gang. Cool in the gang. Cool in the gang. Oh, oh the gang. yes. Oh, yeah, and we just lost Ronald. Ronald, Ronald. Yes. Yes. yes, yes, yes. You know, Khalees gave us the most beautiful interview because he, he talked about Cool in the Gang being on the show. It was their first television show, and it gave them a lot of exposure. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they played Who Can Take the Weight? Mm-hmm. Wow, wow. And it was going to take the weight, and they played chocolate buttermilk. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that just broke my heart when he passed. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. He was so much the uh, kind of musical soul. You know, he wasn't the, the lead, right? But he was the heart. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, and, but bad. again, this is an example why I'm so grateful we have him in the film. Yeah. Because he leads us in that whole section. I call that the Battle of the Band section. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. And I'm so, so grateful. So, Melissa, I know that you, uh, you're now upstate a little little ways, but what do you remember about uh, New York at the time that you were growing up and being exposed to? I mean, the, the, what was what was happening on the Upper West Side? And uh, and certainly, I know that HBO had two things. They had uh, vinyl with, of course, Bobby Cannavale, mm-hmm. and then, of course, uh, what was that? The Deuce. The Deuce. Know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so tell me, what are your memories? Well, two things are really significant. And I was only up there when I was little, but mm. as a grown person, I lived in the village. I lived on 15th Street at 8th Avenue. I lived in, wow. also in Chelsea. I was always like in the midst of everything, did all my work right in that area. Um, and I worked with, I worked up at Harlem at Schomburg Center with Ellis. Oh, great. So okay. we spent a lot that's... of time, and, and that's really important too, because Ellis Hayslip was, after Soul, this is sort of jumping ahead, but he, his idea was to bring the same artists who were on Soul up to the Schomburg and help mm-hmm. create a mecca, a cultural mecca, because at the time it was just a library. Yeah. And true, he was trying true. to convince them it needed to be a cultural mecca. They needed to have a stage. They needed uh-huh. to have a And all that agenda. came to pass. Yeah. All wow. that was yeah. Ellis's idea. Wow. But we used to, I worked with him and we used to have to go up to Aaron Davis Hall. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah, at City University, because there was no facilities at the Schomburg to have a cultural moment or an exchange or a program. So he mm-hmm. brought all those folks up there, mm-hmm. and we and he did Founders Day and lots of events. He brought Maya Angelou up there. He did um, all kinds of concerts. So 
my life, I spent so much time in Harlem with him there. I was very shy and nervous about it, you know, the subways. And mm-hmm. it, was, it was a challenging time in the 80s. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Those of you who know the 80s know what I'm yeah. talking about. Mm-hmm. Oh, <laughs> but, yeah. So my memories are, but of course, even as a, a teenager, I was at Dance in Harlem. So I was mm-hmm. always in Harlem from, you know, from jump. But I, but I, I think of Ellis because he would take us to Sylvia's at night after his tapings, and okay, you know, he knew everybody. Nice. Everybody would salute him and give him daps and give him props on the street. He just walked around like a king, and he was our king. Yes. And and Felipe Luciano from the last poet. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. He yes. talked about that. That that mm-hmm. he represented the culture, and we needed that kind of. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to jump forward a little bit because one of the things that I was so impressed with was, all right, you finished this wonderful film and it's time to now get it out. And then boom, there's this pandemic. And so you put together this very, very unique uh, virtual distribution network where you partnered with with all sorts of local cinemas to do virtual launches, including, you know, our friends here in Harlem, Image Nation and Soul mm-hmm. Cinema Cafe. Yes, so tell us, tell us a little bit about, you. yes, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so tell us just about, you know, what you had to go through in mm-hmm. terms of where you were, and then all of a sudden, we're not doing that, and what are we going to do? So lead yeah. us through that process. Yeah. Well, you know, before the pandemic hit and before our sort of um, revolution came into play, everything was status quo in terms of the industry, and there's a certain pattern that you follow when you have a film that comes out. You take it to a film festivals for maybe uh, a couple of months. In our case, we took it out for a year, and we played all the Black Film Festivals. We, we opened at Urban World, and we won mm-hmm. the Urban World Film Festival. We took mm-hmm. the Pan African Film Festival mm-hmm. in um, L.A., and we won that festival. Wow. We went to the Martha's Vineyard African American Film Festival. Shout out to my friends in Martha's Vineyard. Mm-hmm. And um, we took it. We wanted the people to see it. But the thing is, even though film festivals are fun. Mm-hmm. They are limited, and sometimes the community doesn't get involved, and it feels like it's too special, like a film mm-hmm. film crowd instead of, you know... A, right, a regular crowd. folk. Regular yeah. folk, and so we knew that this needed a wider audience, but it was important for us to start at film festivals. We opened right here at Tribeca Festival, mm-hmm. and um, we also played at Real Sisters up in Harlem. Oh, yes, oh, I know it well. Yeah, so we played 50 film festivals in the year. But then after that, we got a little quiet. We were trying to figure out how can we get this film out and find the right distributors. Mm -hmm. And um, we had to work out all of our clearances. And about a year later, when we realized, okay, now's a good time and we should really try to get it out. There weren't a lot of distributors biting at the time. And then suddenly the pandemic hit and nobody expected this to happen. And then what really impacted our decision was when George Floyd was taken from us. And yes. this groundswell of pushback and protest and demand for equality and justice became everything. I mean, you remember, we were glued to our television. We were out there in the streets. We were protesting. I remember thinking, what can I do, though? Because I felt like I couldn't accomplish anything and what would the question be looking back at this time someone said well everyone's going to ask you how did you feel when you were quarantined and what did you how were you feeling about the future and i said i don't want people to ask me how do i feel i want them to ask me well what did you do Mm. what did you do Mm -hmm. what did you do to make a difference what did you do to to fight for justice for Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Aubrey and, and and George Floyd and all of the people that we need to say their names or still say their names. Yes. And that's when I realized that we had already completed this beautiful film that ironically really speaks to the same type of revolution that was happening in 1968 for civil rights and equality 
and really demanding a place in this nation that we built. And I said, you know, this might be the good time to bring the film out if there's a way that we can. All due respect, of course, this is a very difficult time and we wanted everyone to stay safe. We knew people were losing their lives, so we struggled. We didn't want to exploit this moment, but we wanted to give back to the people who are most disproportionately impacted by it, financially, medically, losing their lives, families, and jobs, and just being oppressed by what's happening in this administration. And I said, well, our film is actually a love letter to black culture. It's uplifting, it's meaningful. It reminds people of our greatness. Maybe yeah. this is the gift. Maybe if there's a way we can get it to people safely, it will make a difference. So our, we started out with three theaters that we partnered with mm -hmm. it, as a way to also support them because th these are theaters that are also have closed their doors. And then suddenly it picked up and we got about 57 theaters by the time we opened in August 28th. And by now we're up to 90 cinemas, virtual cinemas. Wow. It was beautiful. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's a model that's new. We're making it up as we go along, but it's by us for us. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you, we're partnering with the type of art house cinemas or cultural institutions, museums, everyone whose doors are closed, but who would support us and film festivals and that we want to support them mm -hmm. and give you a chance. Like when you buy a ticket to stream Mr. Soul, it, all these little mini streaming hubs, your 50% of your purchase goes to support them. So that means Soul, Soul Cinema, you know, Image Nation is being mm -hmm. supported. That means Studio mm -hmm. Museum of Harlem is being supported. Mm -hmm. That means, um, uh, we did something with Maisel's Documentary Center. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we're okay. getting ready to do a big event uh, with the Schomburg Center. And these oh. are all our cultural institutions that we would mm -hmm. love to give back to. So when you buy a ticket, you're giving back to them and supporting them while their doors are closed. You're also supporting independent filmmakers and black filmmakers like me. And you know, mm -hmm. we don't get enough love. So it's just a really interesting model that people started to understand and they really enjoyed it. And because we didn't want anyone to fall ill, it was really important that nobody came out to a theater on our behalf. Mm -hmm. So we wanted you to be home and watching it and safe. So we encourage anybody, we put it up on the screen, uh, MrSoulMovie.com. You need to mm -hmm. go there right now mm -hmm. and check it out. Um, find your local um, your local uh, theater partner and go through them and buy a ticket for this movie and watch it and and bring your fan don't just watch it by yourself I would say pull your family around and watch it together yeah. you'll have a, a great time um, if you're in Harlem like I said we, we we have to shout out our friends at Soul Cinema Cafe yes. we love them so much yes. but, yeah but Maisel's, Maisel's the Museum yep. they're, all, they're all our Schaumburg, friends yes so you have yeah, a lot and, a lot of options here yeah and Bam this. Film is playing it too Bam yeah, Bam shout out Brooklyn yeah, Bro shout out Brooklyn out. Mm -hmm. yep. Republic of Brooklyn in the house. <laughs> so um, I want to go back to August 28th because I think you had an experience that probably had to be tremendously special, which is that you did after the screening, you did this talk back with this amazing panel. And I, I, I was uh, grateful to have a chance to caught it because I was like, oh my God, who's on there? So you had Amanda Seals hosting this and then you had Stan Lathan, who I had Stan. no idea. Wow. St Stan basically got launched. He was the director for Soul. And, That's right. and he has come on. He's probably been, you know, one of the most. And he won, he won an Emmy the other night. That's right, mm -hmm. for Dave Chappelle. You know, yes. he won, won yes. the Emmy. And Jay, Dave Chappelle uh, basically kind of cussed out the industry <laughs> for not giving him one before this. Uh, yes. But, First directing Emmy, and he's this been directing is... since 1968. Yeah, yeah. So, Shout out. Um, so <laughs> that's you know, it's, so it's it's funny. You, I just see these great threads of black excellence. You know, Reggie Hudlin directed that particular Emmy episode. Yeah, and it, it's just funny to see the through lines between then and now. And so to see Stan finally get his uh, his just 
dues, his props, if you will. Yeah. Uh, you know, while he's while he's still on while this side of that's right. Okay, on but let me side. get back to this talk back. Because, Go ahead. Okay, so 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 you're seeing Stan Lathan, and then the next thing you know, you know, here's Amanda Seals, and oh, here comes Sonia Sanchez and and Nikki Giovanni, <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, what's going on here? And then oh oh, Ro- Robert Glasper is dropping in. I'm like, oh my, what? Is- <laughs> What is happening here? And Melissa, <laughs> Melissa is sitting up in the middle of this, and she's just like shining. You could just see <laughs> light coming from her. She's like, yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, you know. And so, tell us a little bit about that experience for you, because it was great for me. But I know it had to have been, you know, just uh, amazing for you to have this thing going on and to have this collective. Uh, you know, in one place live talking about this experience of not just the film, but the, oh, did I mention the last poets were on there as well? And um, Black Ivory. And Black Ivory. Mm, wow. And Layla Hathaway. And Layla no. Hathaway. And, and Common did a little drop in at the no. end. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my right. God! Was, you're you're big time, Melissa. Uh, yeah. You're big time. You're big time in it. <laughs> you know, it's just like, it's it's just we are standing on the shoulders of giants. And yes, what we I are. think is what Ellis Hayslip did in paying homage for me, it's always about honoring the source. Yes, honor the source. I think yeah. that's the most important thing. And mm-hmm. I all I could think of was what would Ellis do? Right. Mm-hmm. This is like a a. a we wanted to recreate the soul show. And so mm-hmm. we said, well, who would be like a great host of soul nowadays? Yeah. And I immediately thought of Amanda Seals, A, because mm-hmm. she's a woman, but mm-hmm. also because last year she posted a clip on her Instagram of James mm-hmm. Baldwin talking to Nikki Giovanni. Mm-hmm. And wow. they about, nearly about broke the internet. Yeah. Mm. Now let's talk about that because that's one of those what I call soul moments. Yeah. You know, where yeah. where Nikki Giovanni actually went to London to interview uh, James Baldwin. So tell us a little bit about what you know yeah. about how that transpired. That was a crazy, incredible episode. It was actually a two part episode, a two mm-hmm. hour special. Mm-hmm. Because uh, Nikki Giovanni had been working closely with Ellis Hayes. So she was his muse. And he had mm-hmm. helped her by doing, uh, helping bring her voice out and really creating the first spoken word album um, that was combining um, gospel music with poetry. Of course, mm-hmm. we, all, we already had The Last Poets and Dylan mm-hmm. Kane and everybody doing mm-hmm. that, but we didn't have a woman doing that. Mm-hmm. And so he helped to produce her Truth Is On Its Way. Mm-hmm. And and she, in turn, would help to host his show. So as a sort of a payback, she said, you know, you owe me, Ellis. And uh, <laughs> he said, well, what would you like to do? And she said, I want to I want to talk to James Baldwin. And Ellis said, well, that's easy, because I know James Baldwin. And he said, well, I know Jimmy, or his exact name. <laughs> and remember, um, Ellis Hazel had first worked with Jimmy in 1965, when mm-hmm. he produced the very first European tour of the the, the, the musical play, um, uh, the musical play. Now, oh my gosh, now I'm going blank. Oh, okay. Well, I'll get back to that. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, so it was an amazing play that James Baldwin wrote, and and Ellis Hayeslip produced it, mm-hmm. and. So they had this relationship that was based on that, and he had brought him on the show several times. And so um, James was living in France mm-hmm. because he was not happy with America and what yep, was going yep. on. Mm-hmm. And so the idea was, well, let's do a, you want to talk to him, let's make it a conversation. But we're going to have to figure out how to get to him because he's, He's over America and has, you know, mm-hmm. all the Jim Crow and, madness. And, and this is after uh, Malcolm had been assassinated? Yes, it's after okay. Malcolm had been assassinated. And so they, um, so he said, well, let's go, let's meet him halfway. And Jimmy said, well, can you meet me in London? And Ellis said, of course. 
Now, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know anyone who's going to London in 1971 and saying, of course. <laughs> but, <laughs> but they did it. And they got the crew together and they flew to London. I think they recorded at a BBC studio. Nice. And what transpired was this exquisite conversation between two of the greatest African-American literary icons mm -hmm. of our time. Yes. And one is younger, one is older, but he, he was only 45. And, and, but, but James Baldwin was like a mentor to, mm -hmm. and, and also an idol for mm -hmm. Giovanni. And what mm -hmm. transpired was this beautiful conversation about black love, black uh, strength, black conflict, between a man and a woman trying to hold it down in the relationship. It was like just such straight realness, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's really, really very, very powerful. I think it's the high water mark. It's like the most important episode of the entire season of 130 shows because it, wow. it is, you just don't get to see black intellects like that and you mm -hmm. don't see black literary icons talking to each other mm -hmm. you know, or you don't see their minds thinking the interiority mm -hmm. you just don't see that mm -hmm. and ellis knew that what they had to say was valuable and sort of juxtaposing this old older gentleman elder statesman with this young mm -hmm. this brilliant mind would just be fire Mm -hmm. And uh, I absolutely love that so much. And so, yes, getting back to um, Amanda Seals. Oh, and now I remember. I'm going to tell you if, if you want to put this in there. That it's the Amen Corner. Oh, yeah. oh, wow. Yes, yes. Okay. So, so Ellis Hazlip had produced the first mm -hmm. European tour of the Amen Corner in 1965, mm -hmm. and that's how he knew James Baldwin personally. Mm -hmm. So when I was thinking, well, who's going to host this kickback that we're going to do, which is what you know we call a kickback, and we're just mm -hmm. going on the, on the Zoom, mm -hmm. and I thought, well, it has to be someone who's the the legacy of soul, some new artist, mm -hmm. somebody who gets it, somebody who has a platform, who's like a host, but is mm -hmm. also maybe a comedian, and of course, mm -hmm. the first the person I thought of was Amanda Seals, and mm -hmm. she had posted a clip from that episode. I said, wouldn't it be dope mm -hmm. if she could be the host, and she now. Who she's professed that Ellis, that I'm sorry, she's professed that that James Baldwin is her, not like a, but like the closest thing she has that comes to an idol for her, mm -hmm. and that she has modeled her career mm -hmm. as being a black creative and walking in that space as a black intellect. She has modeled mm -hmm. all of that on James Baldwin, and she loves him. Mm -hmm. So I thought, wow. well, wouldn't it be deep if we could have her interviewing Nikki Giovanni, who was yep. the person who was interviewing James Baldwin. It's like mm -hmm. a beautiful mm -hmm. full circle. Mm -hmm. And I had to reach out to her, you know, she's had to, she's very famous and very busy. Mm -hmm. But I I pitched the idea to her um to all of her her team and she just said yes right away, which just wow. really cool. um because she has a lot of things going on. And mm -hmm. is an insecure, and of course, she has her podcast, uh, Small Doses, and she has Smart, Funny, and Black. So she's got a lot. Mm -hmm. But I thought that's what Ellis would be doing if he were around today. He'd have all these different outlets, right, and right, outlets right. And stuff. And you and you literally kind of recreated the feel of the show with the, yeah. all this, and and with with <laughs> original cast members. <laughs> that was that was that was amazing. And we brought in Blair Underwood too, and Blair Underwood. Yeah. Voice of Ellis Hazlip in the film. He's also mm -hmm. one of our executive producers. Wow. So I wanted nice. like an intergenerational soul moment, like soul family. Mm -hmm. I have to say, it blew my mind to see. I mean, I who would ever think you'd have Nikki Giovanni in the Zoom? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and Sonia yeah. Sanchez. Yes. Yeah. You know? Sanchez. You know. And the last poets. Mm -hmm. and wow. Luciano. It was. It was dope. And so you can still you, watch it. If you still want to watch it, you that's can what I was yeah. about to ask. Yep. So yeah, where can you watch it? You can watch it on YouTube on the Mystery Soul the Movie YouTube. You can also watch it on our Facebook. We okay. um, we broadcast it Facebook Live, and it had four thousand views while it was happening. Wow! And that was up nice. to like um, like something like 
200,000 views. It's really a lot of views. Mm. Excellent. Because it's just a beautiful moment. And it was so organic, yeah. unscripted, you know. And so then when Robert. For the full Duff soul experience, I got to say this. You've got to watch the, the film itself, which you yeah. need to mm -hmm. go to one of our film partners. Mm -hmm. Pay right. for a ticket. It's the same price of a ticket you'd pay for a movie, mm -hmm. except you're supporting this whole ecosystem of black independent creators so uh -huh. that 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 money that you spend is going to do more than just going in to see a movie in the movie theater so you want yeah. to do that but the bonus is you can get the uh, the the kickback for free which in and of itself is amazing because you get a chance to where are you going to see Amanda Seals, Robert Glasper, The Last Poets, Nikki Giovanni, Sony Sanchez, uh, Stan Lathan, mm -hmm. and then one of the biggest giants of all, Melissa Hayes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because and I, and, 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 and I got to say this because I'm saying this for Ellis right now because Ellis is looking down and saying, "Okay, I had all these giants, but my little niece is a giant now." And so, uh -huh. you know, um, and, and you've shown that with what you put together. So, you know, you're you're you know, you're in the big leagues now uh -huh. and, and and we're excited to have you on. We're excited to just kind of share these experience with you. Yeah. We only have a couple more minutes left. So I don't know if there's anything else we haven't covered. We talked about all the stuff I wanted to talk about. But Well, uh, I definitely wanted to ask Melissa, OK, now that you've done this monumental work, uh, what's your next project? My next project, very similar to the, the, the desire to amplify women's voices, people of color, and stories that you don't usually get to hear, it's a series about women in hip hop. But it's, the oh. idea is it's really about the, the history of black womanhood in America through the lens of black women in hip hop, their lives, mm -hmm. and their music. Wow. Oh, that's great. Right. That's great. A four part series for Netflix. And I'm really mm. excited about it because hip hop is changing every single day. Yes. Mm -hmm. The narrative is every day changing. I'm just trying to keep up with Cardi and Offset and, you know, Megan mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Stallion. Uh, but it's just really exciting, too, because this idea of seeing it through the lens of our favorite hip hop artist, Missy Elliott, mm -hmm. Latifah, Cardi, N Nikki. You know, E, mm -hmm. and, and, and and everyone who's come since then. Uh, mm -hmm. That's exciting because that is often erased. Women's contribution to hip hop is often erased or not yes. given. Too. Correct. So mm -hmm. I'm really excited about that. That's next, and also getting this film out. We're going to have a PBS broadcast. Mm -hmm. Oh, PBS great! Okay, that. that's fitting. Yeah, yes. that's really oh, fitting. Yeah. 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 So wow. still trying to get the word out and encouraging people to follow us on social. We're at Mr. Soul the Movie on Instagram, Twitter, and mm -hmm. Facebook. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's all about community, lifting mm -hmm. each other up, especially right now, encouragement. Mm -hmm. That's what Ellis was all about black love, black strength, black mm -hmm. brotherhood, black encouragement. And that's what our film represents. And that's what we're about, too. We hope this will start new discussions and you know, help bring us together because art is healing and black yes. joy is revolutionary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you we know? just had, we just went through a revolution because there was a lot of joy in, in just experience what, in what you put together um, for us. And, and, and I speak for Curtis as well, you know, to be able to just kind of relive our own soul yes. experiences and look back with it as a lens because we still also had kind of the 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 child's growing up view yeah. and now you know for us now that we have a little bit more knowledge and experience that we can go back and kind of re-experience what was going on there with a wider understanding it's it's, it's really just amazing incredible well thank you so much for having me and mm -hmm. it really means the world and to be able to celebrate ellis in harlem Shout out. Yes. So, I remember all the DJs too. Jerry B, Jerry Bledsoe was on. Right, the show. right, mm -hmm. yes, yeah. And how he worked closely with Hal Jackson and Hal Jackson's mm -hmm. wife. Oh, yes, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Debbie. Uh, yes. And also uh, his first wife too, Alice. Ah, Anderson. Alice. Okay. Yeah. So mm -hmm. 
that that's key too. Shout out. Shout so out. It's Soul Lounge Prime Time on WHCR 90.3 FM. Our guest today has been Melissa Hayslip, the director yes. of Mr. Soul, a great movie about Ellis Hayslip, the great uh, host and producer of the Soul TV series. Um, thank you. You have an open invitation to come back for whatever yes. project you're working on. That's so right. Let right. us know. Uh, remind you to... Uh, like us on Facebook, subscribe us on YouTube, and listen to us on 90.3 FM, WACR, the voice, voice of Harlem. Harlem. Okay, yes. Harlem. See, see you next Harlem, week. Harlem. Yeah. That's it. <laughs>